Hey guys, what's up? I'm out here at the barn. Jeremiah and I just spent the last little 20 minutes having a conversation, figuring out some logistics, and we're moving the cows around a little bit. So, here is Fern. She's still not calved. Her udder's tightening up. I don't know. She could still be a few days. She could go quickly. I don't know. I was actually going back trying to see in my records what her that her due date was in fact March 1st and it was but it can go actually two weeks in either direction had all of these and these were the ones that were being weaned and we've had them in like a sacrifice pen over winter and we are now getting ready to start on some electric fencing uh, we're using Papa T's land to do the cattle and the grass is beginning to grow so it's time to start moving on that um, for now, we're moving fern over and letting these guys out in this little side paddock where the grass is growing. And uh, the reason for that is that we need to leave this pen up for now because we have to do some vetting of our beef herd. We're gonna have the vet out and like preg test everybody because we should have calves by now. Maybe it's fine, but we wanna make sure that they are indeed pregnant. And if they're not, then there's probably a problem with our bull. They were all running and jumping. Well, they'll enjoy this grass for a little while. There's Hallie. So one of the things that we're dealing with now is we still have De we still have Bo the bull, who is the sire of these heifers. Um, not Hallie, but of the heifers. So he can't have access to them. So. We're having to set up some different pastures and stuff. Eventually, we will replace him with a different bull, but, he, uh, and obviously, if he has an issue and for some reason the cows out there aren't bred, he'll be getting replaced a lot sooner. I don't think so, though, because I'm pretty sure Helen did take. I mean, she's, you feel like Helen's pretty obviously bred, isn't she? She hasn't come back in the heat, and she's starting to really show, so. I don't think there's anything wrong with her. Yeah, I don't know why they haven't, have, but if they haven't, if they are pregnant, they should be due very soon. We have these two are um, steers and they are in here with the heifers right now because obviously they're not going to get them pregnant but they're going to be going back out with the main herd soon. getting fern in a halter because as soon as she calves we're gonna have to start bringing her into the stanchion so today is the big day hatch day the flies are starting back with the warm weather so I always have to make sure this thing's closed but look we have babies so here I've got um, a little brooder set up I have the um, heat plate which we use these we get them from McMurray Hatchery. I'm actually going to move this one down a little bit. So I've actually seen a little bit of controversy regarding these heat plates and people basically saying that they think these are why their chicks died and I don't know. Um, I don't agree with that. I think if they're set up properly you're not going to have a problem. We've been using these for a few years now. Uh, we started with heat lamps the way, you know, obviously many people do. And then we got heat plates, but sometimes we would use a heat lamp. Um, and once we had a heat lamp in our basement with some quail and it fell and caught on fire, um, thankfully it was like this crazy situation where Jack's or Asher had gotten up late or something like that and basically smelled it and they caught it and our house didn't burn down. All the quail died. Um, but Jeremiah was able to put the fire out and obviously save our house. It was in the basement. Nobody was like sleeping down there. It could have very easily burnt our house down. Uh, since then, we do not use um, heat lamps except for in the rear situation of setting them up outdoors where basically they're extremely secure. And uh, even then, I don't like to do it. That's been very rare. So what I do with the heat plates is, is I actually set them up on an angle. So if you can see this, this is gonna sit like this. 
and basically the chicks are able to go underneath it it's sitting on the ground like this and they're able to go further back and get closer to it and press up against it or if they just want a little bit of warmth they can stay towards the opening um, and that has worked for us and we've brooded a lot of chicks this way so I've just got this tote or this tub um, they'll be able to jump out of this within a week, but I can put some sort of like wire on top, uh, probably something with like chicken wire or maybe a piece of fencing or something that's small enough that they can't jump through. This is pine shavings and I've got little waters and feeders. I'm not going to put these in right now because they don't need it, um, right now. Chicks don't need to eat or drink for at least the 24 hours after being born. I usually put those in the next day. Um, just because they're going to be bumbling around and finding their feet. I don't want them to like fall in the water or anything and then be wet and cold. So I just put them in here. They're going to get under the warmth. They have everything they need because they actually absorb the yolk before they hatch. And that's how ships are chips, chips. That's what Benjamin called them, which today Benjamin turns eight. If you've never seen the baby chips clip, well, I'll just show you here now because I'm a mom and you know. What do you have? Baby chips. Baby chips? Yeah. Is it so cute? It's so cute. It's so cute. It's so cute. Are you being super gentle? Can you even? He's eight today and he's sharing his birthday with these baby chips. Um, what was I saying? But that's how baby chicks are able to be shipped because they do hatch with everything they need for the first 48 hours of life. So in here, here's the conundrum, and this is, I've always had an issue with this. Uh, right now, these little guys are bumbling around as they do, and they're knocking the other eggs around. And these other eggs, there are chicks in them trying to hatch, and that can actually cause them to have a struggle. Now the problem is, is when I open this, I'm gonna let all the humidity out. Um, so I'm gonna move really fast. I'm gonna set the camera down and move really fast. Guys in here, So I always just stick them right under the heat plate so they know what's up and they immediately move back towards the back um, where they can press up against it and be warm. This is called ambient heat which it more um, mimics the mother hen where they can go under for warmth and then come out. It's also not cold in this room. The milk room we our milk room is not heated or cooled we've been having pretty warm days so it's it's fairly comfortable in here it's too cold for a baby chick with no extra heat but it's not like cold air around it mm. tonight we'll probably plug in we have a little space heater out here um and we'll probably plug in a space heater just to warm this room so that when the temperature drops tonight it doesn't get too cold in here where that heat plate isn't enough so I opened this. Oh, this little incubator. This is my test run on this incubator. I've never used it before and um, I've had good reviews. So far, I've been pretty impressed. It just got back up to 65% humidity after me opening it, which is really good. It probably helps that it is very humid here. So I see a couple other eggs that have zipped. That's what this is called when they've pecked out kind of a line. Um, and they might have gotten turned over. So I'm gonna, again, open this really quickly and turn these guys upright so that if there are any that are on their way out like this, they, um, you know, they, they probably got turned over by those chicks that were walking around. And then I'm gonna put a little more water in it, close it back down and leave it. Okay, so just really quick, I, I, I'm only gonna be able to show you so much cause I can't really hold this open and hold the camera on the angle and I don't wanna move it and disturb them. You see that little crack right there on the top of the egg? That's called a pip. And a pip is what they do first, which I don't know if you guys can see the movement in these eggs, but like occasionally they'll shake a little bit. And I just counted seven that I saw had pipped. Um, one is zipped, so it's almost out, that little baby right there. Um, and I'm gonna put a little more water in here so we can get the humidity up because that helps them to not dry out when they're getting out of the egg. 
We want that. All right. So when you candle a normal egg, these are these Moran's eggs. Which here's one that one of those babies came out of. Um, these are really dark and they're very difficult to see through. So it's not quite normal. If I were hatching a lighter egged breed, I would candle them like three days before they were due and I would be able to see internally. First, their, their beak breaks through into the air cell in the egg and you can actually candle them a few days before and kind of know if they're gonna hatch. I couldn't because those are so dark and they get darker as the incubation goes on because the membrane inside starts developing and it makes them harder to see through. But that pip, I, I really haven't known for sure how many of these would hatch. I put 22 in, three weren't fertile, so I've already tossed those, so I have 19 now and we'll see. But I'm hearing lots of little peeps come out of this. Um, well, they're quiet now. Look at this, hold on. You all see this little baby? It keeps moving a little bit. That one will probably hatch. It's a very slow process. That one will probably hatch in about within the next hour or so, I would guess. Now the internal pip, which is where they break into the air cell, happens usually like two days before they hatch. And then the pip happens, which is that first little crack. They crack the outside. Um, and then usually they're out of the egg within like 24 hours of that pit. A zip, which is where that one is when they've zipped the egg, is when they break kind of a line. And then they rest for a while. And then at some point after it's zipped all the way around, they'll break the line all the way around the shell from inside one little bit at a time. And then they push really hard and it cracks the egg open and they just sort of fall out. And they're exhausted at that point. They just lay there. Um, they're all wet and stuff. Now, these little guys, as much as they were moving, they probably came out of the shell overnight. Uh, Maya actually called me this morning when I was on my way home from the gym. He came out here to milk. And he told me that I had four chicks. So, um, yeah. So far, it's going pretty well. Um, now, tomorrow, they could still be hatching tomorrow. Today was hatch day, 20, day 21, day 22. By day 23, if there's no pip or no action, you can pretty much count that egg as a dud. Sometimes I'll give it one extra day just because I have had like quite late hatchers before, but usually by day 23, you know that they're not coming out, so. But yeah, that's pretty good. Um, I had very low expectations. This is my first time using this incubator. Um, Moran's eggs are also notoriously difficult to hatch because of that coating that's on the outside of the egg that makes it dark. To have already had four come out of the 22 that I, that's obviously a low hatch rate, but to already have had four come out and have seven other eggs that have pipped, if all of those, if just those successfully hatch, I would call this um, a successful hatch rate considering I was learning that machine and all that stuff. Um, I have a big incubator, which it's at our friend Wes's house. And actually he's got like a good brooder set up and that's where our spring chicks that we got from McMurray are. We just got them a few days ago that are some, um, they're like some hybrid egg layers because Maya's wanting to do a big mobile coop to sell eggs at our store when it opens. But um, with that incubator, so much of it is automated that I can pretty consistently get like an 80% hatch rate, which is a pretty good hatch rate considering, you know, like some of the eggs you said are not gonna be fertile and different things like that. But um, if I were to get like a 60% hatch rate on this little incubator, I would think that was really good. Hey guys, it's afternoon now. I'm gonna run out here and check on the chicks. It's been a few hours since I was out there last. The cattle seem to have settled into their arrangement. Delmer and Hallie are laying down there next to each other. Anytime you have a flock or a herd of anything, when you put them together, there's going to be a little bit of establishing of the pecking order. And so they all ran around with each other for a little while, but now they've settled into grazing, which is good. All right. Let's see. 
Alright, well there's the little guy I told you guys would be out soon. Michaela actually sent me those pictures I put on earlier. She came out here to get some milk. She sent me the first video saying, uh, should I do anything? And I said, nope. And I guess before she walked out, he had popped out of the egg. So I'm gonna leave him in there to dry off. I wanna make sure that he gets dry. Um, I don't see any major progress on any of the other eggs. I mean, I see all the pips few wiggles here and there but I think I'm just gonna leave it alone and we should have we should have um, several more chicks out probably before we go to bed tonight and if not they'll all be running around there in the morning I'll look around here yep little happy fluffy babies hanging out down the back by the back come on camera you can focus all right you see the tip of his little beak I don't know if you can see it let me back it up um, he's got a little little sharp point right here and that is called an egg tooth and that's actually um, how they get out of the shell so that little sharp point actually falls off the tip of their beak after the first couple of days of being hatched but isn't that so fascinating like they have this little part that's just there because they have to break through a shell to get into the world. I just think that's wonderful. One of the cats just popped in here. I'm going to shut this door because I definitely don't want that. The cats are precisely why the breeder is set up here in the milk room and why we sent our new McMurray chicks to um, Wes's for the next probably two weeks. Then they should be feathered out enough that we can put them out in the shocker knot net. But um, when you have barn cats, you have to consider that they do hunt and I do not want them hunting my baby chicks. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I'll update you uh, once, maybe the next vlog, once we have more babies out and we'll get a final count. Happy birthday, little guys. And happy birthday, sweet Benjamin. It's a birthday filled week for us. Toby's is in a few days and then Noah's is a few days after that. So busy mama. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. I'll bless you until next time.